Good, good afternoon, everybody. I'm, I'm going to keep uh, I'm going to keep things moving. Uh, I, I, I hate to say it, but but uh, Mr. S uh, Dr. Sachs's last remark uh, remarks reminded me of that scene from Woody Allen's movie Sleeper, where where he wakes up and and the, in the future and the doctor is standing over him smoking. And Woody Allen says, well, what are you doing smoking, doctor? It's terrible for your health. And the doctor says, well, no, we now know that smoking. So data will change. Hopefully, we will learn new things as we move forward. Anyway, thank you all very much online and in person. Uh, we will now be talking about the utilization of scientific and tech technical expertise in courts. And we have a fabulous panel here. Uh, we will be hearing uh, from Dr. Joe uh, Cecil. Uh, who is a senior project consultant at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine's Committee on Science, Technology, and Law. Uh, we've referred to this before, the uh, CSTL. Uh, and a senior fellow at the Civil Justice Research Initiative at UC Berkeley Law School. He recently retired from the Division of Research at the FJC, the Federal Judicial Center, where he examined access to justice issues in federal courts. While at the center, Dr. Cecil also focused on the role of scientific evidence in federal courts, conducting empirical research projects on admissibility of scientific evidence in civil and criminal litigation, and the role of court-appointed experts. He is presently directing the development of the fourth edition of the Reference Manual on Scientific Evidence, which will be published jointly by the Federal Judicial Center and the National Academies. Dr. Cecil was a member of the National Academies Committee on Science, Technology, and Law, and was appointed to a number of panels of the National Academy of Sciences, including panels issuing reports on eyewitness identification and forensic science. Dr. Cecil received his JD and a PhD in psychology from Northwestern University. Um, in the interest of time, maybe we should have you go right ahead, and I'll do the next uh, introduction thereafter. Thank you. Go. Yeah. Yeah. And okay, that should work. Thank you, Elaine, um, and uh, thank you for coming. It's wonderful to be here. Um, you know, it's late in the day, and I don't know about you, but I haven't heard a lot of uplifting stories <laughs> about science in the court. So my job is to be here and keep hope alive. Uh, what I want to do is talk about a number of instances where courts have attempted to strengthen their ability to take care of, of scientific evidence. Have, th these are not all sparkling successes, but neither are they abysmal failures. And it seems that what we need to do is look at some of these instances and see if we can reshape, retool, and kind of at least make incremental progress in this area. You know, courts are really um, very conservative, some might say reactionary, and they're unlikely to adopt, they're unlikely to adopt a great departure from what they regard as the proper procedures that they followed in the past. So the examples I have are instances where the courts have taken some aspect of the way courts have worked in the past, and by tinkering and changing it slightly, uh, they've attempted to do a better job of looking at science. Now, I should mention that uh, my experiences in federal courts, uh, in fact, almost all of my experiences in civil litigation, and the issues that I'm concerned about in this instance are questions about admissibility of evidence. So with those qualifications, let me see if I can make this work. OK. Um, these are the four instances that I want to talk about. All of these have been used in federal court uh, in very difficult cases that involve challenging, mean, challenging uh, scientific evidence. Uh, Court-appointed experts, special masters, technical advisors, and then, of course, the reference manual. These cases all invo uh, were invoked in circumstances where the courts felt that they required some extraordinary assistance, where the normal mechanisms simply were not adequate to deal with the kind of problems of admissibility that the courts are faced with, the kind of decisions that judges must make. So uh, let me just move through these four uh, rather quickly. Court-appointed experts makes perfect sense. If you're a judge sitting in a court, you want a witness who knows something about the, who knows the answers to the questions that are being asked. So one of the normal, natural solutions is to allow the court to call an expert 
who is, an ex who is skilled in the area and can respond to the questions either the attorneys present or that the judge presents. And you find this authority in Rule 706 of the Federal Rules of Evidence. On a party's motion or on its own, a court can uh, order the parties to show why an expert witness should not be appointed. And the rest of that rule has a lot of information about how to go about making the appointment, how to compensate the expert. You would think that this would work. Uh, but in fact, what we have is a history of pretty much unbroken uh, failures or at least very modest successes in trying to use court-appointed experts. We have one instance where I think in multi-district litigation, the Silicon Breast litigation, uh, a panel of court-appointed experts were employed. Uh, I think they provided the court with valuable assistance in making admissibility decisions about the kind of harm and damage that uh, faulty silicon gel breast implants caused. Uh, but in, it's never been used again in federal court. And the question is, why isn't it used more often? We did a study back in 1993, or before Daubert, about why, courts, why experts are not appointed. And we learned two things. First, we learned that just procedurally, it's very awkward. You, uh, you have to, it takes a lot of time to find the expert, find a qualified expert to set up the compensation. So there's a lot of things that have, a lot of upfront work that has to be done. And many times judges don't realize that they need a court appointed expert until the eve of trial. So that's the first problem, procedural problems. But the fundamental problem is that the attorneys are just devoted to the adversarial system. Most of these attorneys worked, uh, I'm sorry, judges are devoted to the adversarial system. Most of them worked as litigators in their past lives. They know how to shop for an expert. They know how to find an expert that can drive the result that's appropriate for their client. And the fear, if you're a judge, is that you will, in fact, appoint one of those experts and you will <laughs> unintentionally determine the outcome of the case. When we talk with judges, that's the big hesitation they, find, they, they worry about. They worry that there's an improper delegation of authority. And, and these problems uh, exist uh, throughout the federal judiciary. So that's the first one, court-appointed experts. The second one, special masters, has also been around a long time. Special masters have been appointed typically in cases where there was an accounting or some ministerial function and a special master would then be appointed by a rule, maybe an accountant uh, would, be a, would be appointed by the court and then figure out what to do about the damages. So these were primarily ministerial issues. Um, we have seen this technique adopted, or, or I'm sorry, adapted to help courts deal with complex evidence. There's an antitrust case out of the Seventh Circuit in which uh, Dan Rubenfeld was asked to serve as an economist and help the court structure how the, how the litigation should be framed, how the classes should be determined, what falls into the various uh, uh, appropriate groups so they could be combined. I think that was a big success. Certainly the judge felt that it was a success. Uh, the attorneys didn't like it very much. But nevertheless, that was a, an instance where using a special master, the authorities in Rule 53, um, was able to help the court. And there's a qualification in Rule 53. You'll see that the special masters are supposed to be required only when it's ex the court needs extraordinary assistance. And over time, there's been a change in the way that language has been interpreted. Uh, and we could talk about that a little bit more if you wish. Technical advisors, you may not have heard this term. When you hear technical advisor assisting the court in terms of scientific experts, think about a scientist who's working as a law clerk, because that's basically what it is. The judge can appoint someone on the authority of the court. There's no rule that gives this, but on the court's own authority, a judge can appoint a scientist who will then work closely with the judge at the judge's elbow and help the judge deal with the kind of complex information that's coming in, especially in a case that involves an admissibility hearing. The technical advisors, attorneys hate technical advisors, as you might guess, because the attorneys are losing control of the presentation of evidence in the case. What the attorney is rightly worried about is that the, te the technical advisor is going to be whispering in the judge's ear some information that may or may not be true, but that might cause the case to, to turn in a way that uh, the attorney certainly may not want, 
uh, and it may even be an unreasonable way. So technical advisors uh, have this function about, uh, I'm sorry, there's a Ninth Circuit case involving appointment of a technical advisor in a, uh, an instance involving psychometric testing, very complicated issues involving psychometrics. Uh, and in the court, uh, he was able to make a, a structure the litigation so that it made sense uh, to psychometricians who were actually reviewing this. The, uh, so technical advisors are always worth uh, a word, but they're very, very rare. Rare as hen's teeth is the way the appellate court referred to this practice. And the fourth one, one of my favorites, <laughs> is the reference manual on scientific evidence. And in this, just think about a classroom textbook in science. That's really the source, the origin, and the inspiration for the reference manual on scientific evidence. But there's an important difference. If you're a student in graduate school and you're designing a research experiment, those textbooks are probably exactly what you need. But if you're a judge trying to make a decision about admissibility, that's really a difficult way to get the information that you require. You know, the role of the judge in that circumstance is very much like the role of an editor in terms of deciding the quality of a publication. And the judge has to decide whether the information there is, uh, is, is suitable, is appropriate for admissibility. What we've tried to do in this reference manual is to reshape the scientific information that graduate students usually get into a format that makes it more accessible to judges, that provides judges uh, an indication of what the key conflicts are most likely to be, and provides judges with a basis for a reason and principle decision. This doesn't give the judge the answer about whether it should be admitted or not, but it allows the judge to know enough about the instance so the judge can have a thoughtful conversation with the experts and with the attorneys. And if you take a look, uh, there are about 18 different topics listed up there. Um, the third edition, uh, I'm sorry, the fourth edition that we're working on adds the last four, eyewitness identification, computer science, artificial intelligence, and climate science. And in addition, there's going to be a, an introduction by Elena Kagan, Justice Elena Kagan, uh, as well as a chapter that really talks about the framework for admissibility. So when we think about how difficult these tasks are, and they certainly are difficult, I'm not saying that, that this makes it easy. What we might think about are taking these kinds of mechanisms that judges have used in the past, reshaping them and finding some means, some technique, for making sure the judges get the kind of information that's necessary so the judge can make a thoughtful decision about whether that evidence should come into court. Our goal here is quite simple. In terms of educating judges, we want to make things as simple as possible, but not any simpler. Thank you, Albert Einstein. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, indeed. Um, we will next be hearing from Dr. Sherry Seedman Diamond, and um, who is the Howard J. Trinan's professor of law and a research professor at the American Bar Foundation. Uh, an attorney and social psychologist, she is one of the foremost empirical researchers on, jury pro on the jury process and legal decision making, including the use of science by courts. She has authored or co-authored more than 100 publications in law reviews and behavioral uh, science journals. Her publications on juries and surveys have been cited by the U.S. Supreme Court as well as other federal as, and state uh, courts. Uh, Professor Diamond practiced law at uh, Sidley Austin. Uh, she has also taught at the University of Chicago, Harvard, and the University of Illinois at Chicago, and served as editor of the Law and Society Review, and was president of the American uh, Psychology Law Society. Um, as a member of the ABA's American Jury Project, she helped craft the principles for juries and jury trials adopted in 2005. Thank you. Over to you. It got bigger. 
Well, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, I, uh, this panel is um, a little bit of a combination panel of uh, with trying to come up with some ways uh, that we can improve the relationship between uh, science and law. And um, that is a topic that I have been studying uh, with my colleague Rick Lempert for the past couple of years. Uh, so uh, I, will, I will give you a little bit of, of the material from our res research. Um, well, I made that go away. That's not what I wanted. How do you advance it? Oh, these, very good, thank you very much. Um, so I thought I'd start by just uh, giving you a little bit of background about the uh, other context of, of science and law. It's not just um, federal and high profile uh, cases where we see experts and where there is an issue with experts. Uh, so I did some research with my colleague Mary Rose on the uh, uh, Arizona Jury Project where we were permitted to videotape 50 civil jury deliberations. Um, and they ranged from a motor vehicle to medical malpractice. They involved um, experts in these cases. Now, some of the experts were not scientists and engineers, but many of them were scientists and engineers. And 84% of the cases uh, had experts. Um, and th that means that experts are, are, are rampant um, throughout the legal system. Uh, that's similar to some research that um, Sam Gross did some years ago with very similar uh, results. Um, and 77% um, of the experts had an opposing expert. So we're talking about uh, litigation that uh, where experts play a major a major role. Um, so what do juries do with those experts? Because we were able to videotape the deliberations, um, we could assess whether the jurors were paying any attention to the experts. We heard earlier today about a judge who said, well, I just decide who I'm gonna, who's more credible, and then I don't really listen to the content. Um, I don't know how many judges do that. I can tell you our jurors did not do that. Um, they talked explicitly about 90%, um, 89% of the experts. And when they talked about them, they talked primarily about the substantive content of their, um, of their testimony. Um, and importantly, in Arizona, where we did the study, jurors were permitted to submit questions um, for witnesses through the procedures that Valerie talked about, um, vetting uh, for uh, acceptability with the evidence. And um, the jurors asked questions in ne of nearly, for nearly half of the, of the live experts. If an expert was uh, on video uh, uh, and had been pre-taped, they couldn't ask questions. That's a problem with that, right? Um, so when we talk about um, uh, what they're paying attention to, I can tell you that in these cases, they are paying attention. It doesn't mean that they got the evidence right all the time. And some of the experts weren't very communicative, so it was hard to get it right. But that's an issue of the presentation and the quality of the presentation as much as by the uh, decision makers. Now, this study, uh, the, what, what we're, I'm going to be talking primarily about here is um, how experts um, behave and how they respond to their experience in the legal system. And this study came about uh, because uh, I, I was intrigued by the claim that um, scientists tend to be leery of lawyers in the legal process, preferring not to venture into the courtroom. That came from uh, an, a, a book by the uh, National Research Council in 2001. Um, and so, so the my question was, um, to what extent is that claim accurate? Um, and, you know, if it's accurate, is there any reason for the reluctance? And if so, what can be done about it? Now, um, the research that we did 
Um, I was concerned that the quality of expertise that was being offered to the courts was not always as high as would be desirable. I think we've heard a little bit about that today. Uh, and uh, uh, from reading uh, uh, appellate court cases, uh, when I was teaching scientific evidence, there was support for the fact that there were some problems out there. And similarly, that uh, um, uh, when I had, I've testified in court and seeing other people testifying, not been all that impressed. So what I thought maybe was going on was that the scientists were unwilling to participate. The best scientists were not willing to participate. So uh, Rick and I began this survey uh, project with a survey of members of the uh, Academy, uh, the Academy of Arts and Sciences. And what we uh, did was we selected the people who were s scientists or engineers to be participants in our sample. Um, then we did a second sample, and that's one that I'll spend more, more, most of my time talking about today. Um, and that was a broader sample, thank goodness, thanks to, thanks to AAAS, uh, gave us access to the um, scientists and engineers who are members of AAAS. Um, we tried to get um, other samples of the experts who hold out their wares to the public for, uh, 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 for purposes of being hired as experts. Um, those were difficult to come by. Um, the folks uh, who have directories of this were not uh, willing to share, um, but we ultimately were able to get a couple of uh, samples of folks who spend 50% um, get 50% or more of their um, uh, income uh, from um, uh, work in, uh, as experts in litigation. Half of them in our sample uh, had, were 50% or more. And then finally we had a sample of uh, trial attorneys, uh, kind of an elite group of trial attorneys uh, who, uh, who are members of an invitation only uh, uh, group and we gave them uh, some of our questions. So I'll tell you a little bit about this in relation to some basic things about what we found. Um, are scientists being asked for assistance? Are they agreeing to participate? Well, I was surprised. Um, that is, in our sample, over half of the Academy members said that they had been asked to assist. It was 40% for AAAS. Uh, and of those who were asked, um, most of them participated and provided assistance uh, at least once. So there was some um, responsiveness to the, um, uh, to the request for assistance from the legal system. Uh, and, uh, and so we, 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 you can see that in these results. Now, the question is, when did they not participate? Okay. When did they not participate? So we asked them, thinking back to all the times you turned down requests to serve as an expert, what were your most common reasons for refusing. And these results that are on this slide are the ones of the most prominent reasons given. So the most common reason given for not participate, for turning down a, uh, a request, was timing or other commitments. Not surprising that would these, most of these folks from the Academy and from the um, AAAS have other kinds of activities that are their basic um, activities. Outside the area of my expertise, now think about that. This is a mismatch problem. That is, they're being asked to do something, offer expertise in an area that they don't feel is in their wheelhouse, that they are qualified to be experts in. This is the first flag problem, I think, that we have 
with experts uh, in the courts. Um, the evidence didn't favor the party uh, asking. Great, you don't want them participating if they think that the evidence doesn't favor uh, the uh, party uh, asking. Particular uh, parties or uh, attorneys that they didn't want to work with, okay. Um, well, experts don't have to work with um, uh, somebody that they don't want to work with. That's the, their, their freedom of choice. But it does mean, it may mean, that some parties will find it more difficult to get expert uh, assistance. Doubts about the legal system, I'll say more about that as we move on. But I want to talk about the problem of the mismatch. This is um, the, uh, these are the results from our survey of attorneys. Uh, and we asked them, what sources do you usually use to identify potential experts? And the most common response was a referral from another lawyer. Second, a recommendation from another expert. Third, the client. Fourth, their scholarship. Um, and uh, on the other responses, uh, about 20% of the people, of the attorneys mentioned that they did their own research um, on the internet in order to identify who would be a good expert. Um, an expert referral organization, these organizations are now very frequent and uh, the, yet only 30% of these attorneys said that these were, that was a source that they used for identifying uh, experts. So it may be that the mismatch problem comes about in part because there is not a good group that is able to identify the appropriate expert for an attorney. And that may be something that AAAS could do something about, right? Um, maybe instead of having a uh, situation where they offer uh, advice on who the expert uh, should be, we could have a group of experts um, who would uh, uh, be willing to serve in all kinds of fields for uh, AAAS, AAAS member, a members um, and who could be consulted on who an appropriate expert would be in a particular case. Okay. So that's an idea that came up when we were looking at these. Um, and then there were other kinds of things that didn't seem, at least in the reports of these individuals, to play a role in their selection. Um, uh, they they, they um, uh, didn't turned down because of conflict of interest very much, did turn down because they wanted my reputation, not my knowledge, right? Um, uh, and more of the academy than the AAAS, but, uh, and, uh, but not because of advice of colleagues, not because of an institutional policy against it, and not because of fee issues. Though our open-ended responses show that People liked being paid, right? Um, but not turning down requests because of that. So the items on the initial slide I showed you are the real items that had the effect. So what about future willingness to serve? In the academy, a third of them said extremely likely or very likely, AAAS, 50% said yes, but look at, at unlikely or extremely unlikely. That's a significant number of people who would prefer in the future not to participate again. When we look at people's experience in participating, um, we find that they react differently to different parts of the, uh, of the trial. So these are the results um, for the AAAS on uh, responses to testifying, uh, to being deposed, and to writing affidavits. So on the far left, um, on the far left is the um, uh, very negative, it goes from very negative to very positive uh, in the five bars that you're seeing in each of those. 
And um, you can see that in the for testimony, it was 72.7% positive, pretty positive, right? Um, when it comes to deposition, not so positive, not so positive. Um, and the best part was doing an affidavit. Very similar results from the academy, a depress for uh, a deposition, which after all is basically cross-examination, right? So it's cross-examination without a judge there um, uh, to uh, uh, run interference uh, for you. Um, the affidavit, very positive. That's what experts are frequently used to doing, is writing reports. So it's a more familiar kind of uh, project. Well, uh, we then turn to the question of what kind of changes might be made um, in the system. And Joe talked uh, about greater use of uh, court-appointed experts. And uh, the members of uh, AAAS, who, uh, AAAS who were scientists and engineers um, uh, found that uh, relatively uh, attractive. Um, allowing opposing experts to discuss issues and write a joint report, it, uh, indicating areas of agreement and disagreement. Um, pretty positive there, equally positive there. Allowing opposing experts to question each other in open court. Not so much. Not so much. The experts don't want to be lawyers, right? They want to be teachers and uh, experts. Um, and if you look at the bottom, allowing jurors to submit questions to the judge for the experts to answer, we talked about that a couple sessions ago, um, and the experts were very enthusiastic about that. Um, 89%. And we've seen an increase in the use of uh, allowing jurors to ask questions um, uh, over time. But let's look at the attorney sample. <laughs> yeah. So there's some good stuff here and some not so good stuff here, if you're in favor of any of these reforms. Um, uh, consistent with the greater use of, uh, uh, of, with Joe's discussion about the greater use of uh, court-appointed experts, the attorneys do not want to lose control. Um, and the idea of more use of court-appointed experts is not an appealing one. Allowing joint, opposing experts to discuss issues? I don't think so. Yeah. And worst of all, allowing opposing experts to question each other in open court, that's giving it over to the, um, to the experts, not going to be supported, right? But there is a glimmer of hope here, um, because I've been talking about allowing jurors to ask questions for years. And the first time I gave a presentation to attorneys about that, um, I they became apoplectic. Um, the idea of somebody taking over my case, um, uh, I'm in control of my case, right? Um, but look at the difference here now. You're seeing 63% um, of the uh, attorneys saying that that is um, a, 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 a good uh, change, uh, something positive or, or at least somewhat positive. Um, so there was, has been movement there, and it's the matter of having experience doing it. Uh, you need tryouts, you need attorneys to write about it, their experience, and you need attorneys to then talk to other attorneys um, uh, about that experience. And so um, change, change comes slowly, but it can, in fact, uh, come. So finally, what are the challenges for the future? I think um, identifying competent experts with uh, relevant expertise, you know, solving the matching problem, um, 
Providing experience with the legal, for the legal system um, uh, for experts. What I didn't show you is that experts who had experience with the legal system were more positive toward it than those who didn't have it. Um, and it's do, of course, it's not a, we're, we're not sure that whether that's a correlation or, or has some causal uh, thing to it. We have a little tweak that we tried to do to see if we could tease that out, but that's for another day. The point is that um, there is a more favorable attitude. And finally, perhaps modifying um, legal uh, procedures to make the best use of experts. Um, it may be something like the hot tubbing idea that we uh, uh, heard about earlier today or some version of this, but there is room, uh, I think, for changes in procedure that will uh, cause some improved relations between uh, experts in the legal system. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was that was a great uh, presentation. But now let's move rapidly forward uh, with the presentation of uh, Diane Ottaviniano. Uh, she is general counsel for the American Psychological Association and has extensive experience as both general counsel and outside counsel for dozens of nonprofit, professional, and trade association clients, uh, primarily in the automotive, retail, and healthcare fields. She has represented clients in a variety of contexts, including general commercial matters, insurance recovery, and risk management techniques antitrust claims, and securement of government rights. Uh, at the APA, uh, uh, Ms. Ottaviano leads the Office of General Counsel, comprised of four, four lawyers and a paralegal, uh, which has responsibility for legal issues faced by the association with respect to its internal operations and its policy-making activities. She also runs the association's well-respected amicus curiae, friend of the court uh, program, which provides the U.S. Supreme Court and other federal and state appellate courts with unique scientific perspectives uh, on psychological professional, uh, excuse me, provides them with the unique scientific perspective of psychological professionals on matters of importance to key legal decisions. Prior to joining uh, the APA in June 2016, uh, she spent 24 years at Errant Fox LLP, where she had been a partner and was also chair of the firm's pro bono uh, publico committee. Uh, she holds a JD from Georgetown University Law Center. Uh, over to you. Thank you very much. Okay, excellent. Okay, hello everyone. Um, I, um, as was mentioned, I'm the general counsel. Can people see me? I know I'm short. I feel like I can't, the people in the front can't, maybe I'll stand a little to the side. Um, uh, uh, one of the great things about being general counsel of APA is the amicus brief program. And I'm really excited to have an opportunity to talk with you a little bit about that. Um, it isn't a huge part of my job, um, but it is like my most favorite part of my job. Um, and so uh, uh, really pleased to, to share that. Um, so um, hold on, let me move forward. There we go. Okay. So since at least 1962, um, APA has been using its amicus curiae program to provide appellate courts with the highest quality psychological science in an unbiased and nonpartisan manner. We don't intervene on behalf of plaintiffs or defendants. We intervene because we feel like there's an issue of psychological science that it would be helpful for the court to have. Now, very often our psychological science weighs more heavily in favor of one party than another, but we don't intervene like to help plaintiffs. That's, you know, not so one of the goals of our, um, uh, of our intervention. Um, this just gives you a little bit of an idea. Now, let me just see. I think some of the detail is gone somehow. Okay, my version of this has a lot more numbers. Um, so I'll give, I'll give you my version, or I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it. We've got the 1962. Oh, that's so odd. I don't know how that happened. But anyway, um, possibly when this is 
published or pulled together, the other version can be uh, used. Um, what, I, what I was trying to identify was that in 1962, we filed our first amicus brief, and then in 1977, we were cited in our first Supreme Court decision, uh, and that was a decision in Detroit Edison versus NLRB that was about patient uh, privilege, confidentiality, and test data. Our fifth SCOTUS decision was Hodgson versus Minnesota about abortion in 1989. Our 10th decision was in 2000. Um, in 2009, we got our 16th uh, citation by the Supreme Court in Graham versus Florida about juvenile sentencing. And our most recent citation um, in, a, in a majority opinion uh, is a SCOTUS uh, citation in uh, Hayland versus Brackeen, which is the decision uh, that came out from the court in June. And it was about the, um, uh, about the Indian Child Welfare Act and the interests uh, for children of placing uh, children who um, are not, can't be with their family in another Native American home um, or um, with extended family members. Um, and uh, we submitted um, psychological evidence about enculturation and about the importance of uh, Native children understanding their identities, and the court did rule in favor of uh, that provision in the Indian Child Welfare Act that requires uh, a um, preference be given to um, Native American families in adoption situations. Um, all three of the briefs that we submitted to the Supreme Court this year, uh, or I should say the last term, that. Uh, where, in which decisions were made in June uh, were ones in which um, were decisions in which uh, the or opinions I should say in which APA's brief was cited but in two cases we were in the dissent um, and in one case we were in the majority we liked being in the majority more uh, not surprisingly um, as I mentioned Halen versus Brackeen which is the Indian Child Welfare Act case we were um, cited by the majority there the other two cases that we filed in were uh, students for fair admission versus Harvard which was about race conscious admissions and we were definitely on the losing side on that one um, and then 303 creative in which the court ruled that religious objections uh, over uh, ruled in favor of religious objections over the rights of uh, marginalized um, LGBT communities. Uh, so um, that was disappointing, but it's still good to be noticed. And um, as uh, any of you who are um, following uh, legal opinions and appellate court opinions know, sometimes those dissents can turn themselves into majority. You know, it's good to get uh, the opinion uh, out there and hopefully to build on it. Okay, now let's see if my numbers come up. Oh, I see. Ah, uh, my fault. It was animated, and I didn't realize that. Okay, sorry, folks. Um, so, uh, just to give you like kind of a you know thumbnail sketch, this gives you some of the um, topics that we've been filing on. Um, one of the things that um, that we do uh, is we only do we do less than a dozen briefs a year because we really spend a lot of time on them. Um, we have our experts uh, work with us on figuring out whether there really is scientific consensus on the issue, um, and then we um, work with outside counsel to develop uh, the briefs. And so, if we s invest the time to develop. Um, high quality psychological uh, science and, and, and develop it into an amicus brief, um, we want to be able to use it again if the situation uh, presents itself. So you can see that there are some areas where we've submitted multiple times, and sometimes we use similar briefs. So we did um, 29 of them, this is before my time, but on marriage equality, we were very active in the amicus brief arena. We've done um, 15 briefs, 14 and one in development on the death penalty. 14 on um, psychologists' competencies as um, expert witnesses. Um, and another thing I note here is that we were cited in a number of uh, lower court opinions in addition to the number of cases in which SCOTUS has cited us. Um, I'm gonna see, I don't, and I, I'm not, I don't wanna take anybody's time too much. Well, maybe this won't work. Okay, this is not, does not look it's like it's giving me an opportunity to play, but what I had was a two-minute uh, YouTube video that um, one of our staff members found um, in which it, there was an appellate argument about um, whether or not uh, evidence, uh, 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 testimony, uh, or evidence could be submitted a, a, from a confession of a defendant. Um, and we had uh, submitted an amicus brief in the case and we explained all of the hallmarks of the likelihood of a false confession. You know, there are a number of uh, ways in which it's much more likely that somebody uh, will uh, falsely, can, uh, falsely confess. Um, and one of, among the things that it, this clip that I can't play uh, shows is the attorney for the, um, for the defendant saying that um, the uh, police had provided misinformation uh, to the 
in this case, it was a juvenile who was being um, arrested and detained uh, for a crime. Um, the police had given him misinformation. The police had lied about there being video and eyewitness testimony. Um, the police had minimized the impact of the um, defendant admitting he was there. And, you know, those are all hallmarks of when we see a false confession. And so it was, it's, a, it's a nice clip because it's quite clear that our brief actually helped to frame what the appellate court argument was about. Um, so anyway, uh, that's, you know, one of the ways we feel like we have impact and, and we're um, uh, proud of our program. Okay. So, uh, another thing that uh, the folks on our panel asked me to do is talk a little bit about um, our um, approval process. How do we decide which cases we're going to get involved in? So one of you know the first step is we have to learn about a case, and this is actually one of the hardest parts um, because um, we. Uh, Anybody who's you know has been a plaintiff's lawyer or knows plaintiff's lawyers, you know, like kind of the most important case decisions you make are the ones you turn down, right? Because you don't want to get into a morass. You know, we because we are trying to prove a point and make um, uh, make some uh, good law using psychological science. You know, we we'll, we're a little fussy about the facts and we have to have enough time to do it. And so anyway, and this is why we wind up with only about a dozen of the briefs a year. But so, you know, we receive a request for a brief or we identify one through our environmental scanning, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then um, we have a requirement that at least three psychologists who have subject matter expertise in the area um, believe there is a consensus of the science that would support filing the brief based on our APA Council representatives, which is kind of like the Congress of uh, Psychology um, at APA, uh, APA Council representatives policy, or other clear consensus of psychological science. So it could be kind of adjacent to our council policy or building on our council policy, but definitely a very clear consensus of peer-reviewed um, psychological science. Um, and then we circulate a summary of the what we think the amicus brief would look like to our executive leadership team, including our CEO, for approval, and also for them to look for conflicts because we are a very big organization. So, you know, sometimes, you know, something that we want to say about, I don't know, confidentiality, you know, maybe runs contrary to something somebody else is doing in the policy arena. So we want to look for those conflicts. Um, and then, um, uh, the board of directors is presented with uh, recommendations of the executive leadership team and the and those subject matter experts, um, and is asked to approve the brief. And then we work in the office of general counsel with an outside law firm, and there are you know three or four really good uh, law firms with you know Supreme Court um, appellate experience uh, who work with us, and we develop that brief. Which again, we try to look for things areas where uh, we can reuse the brief in another. Um, in another uh, venue um, because it's a recurring issue. This um, part of our environmental scanning is we have this really fabulous expert panel of uh, psychologists. Some of them are also JDs. Actually, I don't, I'm pretty sure Craig Haney is a JD. Anyway, um, but uh, that's super helpful. Uh, not only helping us to identify cases, but also helping us to identify the right experts. We talked earlier about the mismatch of experts. You know, these are people who, if they don't know about the issue, they know who to ask about the issue. So I'm, I am not a scientist, I am not a psychologist, so I don't necessarily know that. Um, and this is a little more about the amicus expert panel. I don't want to go on too long, because I know people will want, we're at the end of the day, and I'm sure people will want to ask questions. Um, so I'm going to um, walk through these. But I thought this might be interesting to you all. These are issues we're tracking where we haven't yet done, where we haven't recently done and presented the most recent evidence in these arenas. So one is reproductive rights. Obviously, that's a massive issue. Um, there's a fabulous psychological study called the Turnaway Study that shows um, the impacts very often the positive impacts on women of being able to get access to reproductive care and the negative impacts of being forced to go to term with a pregnancy that wasn't wanted. So it's a really great study. It's inconsistent with what some of the courts have been uh, concluding in opinions that don't seem to be based on fact or science. Um, so we are looking for a good opportunity, and I think we're going to have one soon to present some of that work. Um, we are looking at... Um, the death penalty uh, for the late adolescent class, some of you may know in a case called Roper versus Simmons, the Supreme Court said you can't assess the death penalty on someone who was under 18 at the time they committed a crime. Really, the psychological science, the neuroscience, shows that the 
adolescent brain doesn't fully develop until somewhere between 21 and 25. So if that's the Supreme Court's rationale, we should be extending that age oop, at least until 20. So we're hoping to do that. Um, we're looking at gender identity and transgender rights, and we've had some successes um, in the recent past on that. Um, we think um, the use of AI facial recognition software um, is um, huge with respect to eyewitness identification um, and you know, job screening and you know, there's just lots of ways in which we think we may be able uh, to uh, intervene there. And so we, we're working with experts and developing ideas, but we don't have that done. And then race and policing. Um, uh, you know, a bunch of different things have come up about, you know, reasonable suspicion and um, uh, wh whether it's reasonable, for example, for an African-American man to run away when he sees police, or is that a, a cause for reasonable suspicion? For a lot of black men, they don't want to be anywhere near police, right? It doesn't mean they've done something wrong. So anyway, those are some of the issues that we're tracking. And I think that brings me to the end. Thank you very much. All of you, um, I'm just double checking that mics are unmuted, right, so that the wireless one should work. You want to oh. test? Are we good at that? Are we good? I think your microphone. Here we go. All right. Um, I, I'm, I, I don't know if we have any questions yet from either the audience or uh, on, here in person or virtually, but allow me to perhaps. Uh, uh, start off as the sort of moderator with with uh, a question. First, um, from what I've heard today, we seem to have sort of four main challenges here, right? So one is very fundamental, which is the legal system is built to resolve disputes, uh, and and so it's a decision making process where you know the the maybe the details that are important to science aren't necessarily the, the key thing, as I believe, uh, I'm, I'm afraid it's left, but Patrick, uh, one of the attorneys who's had many 40 years of litigation experience, uh, pointed out. So that's one sort of challenge. Two, um, well, it seems like we're often dealing with fairly weak or limited science and math backgrounds for you know judges and, and jurors. Three, uh, we also have an accelerating rate at which science, you know, or scientific knowledge is expanding and, and, and technologies become more and more complex. Uh, four, uh, as was alluded to here re more recently, we have the challenge of um, scientists and engineers and so forth, and doctors probably, uh, actually conveying what they know in a manner that is comprehensible, accurate, and yet also conveys enough, to be fair, of the uncertainty that may naturally exist in a given you know, field of, of study or activity. So here's my sort of tough question for, for each of you, and also because we're, we, you know, we have to move quickly for time. If you had a magic wand uh, from the various things that you all have discussed or previous panels have discussed in terms of possible solutions, to any or all of these problems, be it you know letting jurors ask questions, using more technical advisors, submitting more amicus briefs more often, um, et cetera. What, what would each of you really wish to have the system do? Or how would, how would you change it? How, what would you want to have done, please? Take it away. In any order you wish. Um, so I'm very greedy, and I'd want more than one. <laughs> Right. Okay, we'll give you three. How's that? Um, if you can do it quickly. Uh, <laughs> but is this working? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, great. Um, uh, I, I really am, uh, have found that I think there are two things that would be desirable if I could weigh my magic wand. Um, and uh, some of our experts actually talked about this. We had open-ended questions and, and, and gave them an opportunity to say uh, what they think would improve the system um, uh, uh, more. more. Um, and, um, and two of the things that you mentioned were things that they mentioned. Um, uh, one is uh, the idea of having greater science competency by lawyers, judges, juries, um, so greater, greater appreciation for, for science. Um, the, the second one um, is actually the last thing that you mentioned, which is the having it built into the system 
that, um, uh, uh, that certainty, which is so attractive, right, because we know that it has a really strong effect on making somebody persuasive if they sound confident, um, and, and it's absolute, uh, you know, if, if you don't execute him, he'll kill somebody again for sure, 100%, right? Um, that that kind of absolute statement and certainty um, is something that is never, almost never right, and, um, and there needs to be uh, an appreciation uh, of that. And I know why attorneys don't like experts who sound less than perfectly certain, perfectly logical to do it, but you, you gave me a magic wand. Yes. Absolutely. So, so that's two. Yes. Next, please. Um, well, I also have, I also have two. Um, one is I'm very worried about the information that uh, Sherry put up showing the lack of faith in science and technology. And one of the things I would want to do is to find ways of restoring the faith among the, those who will be serving as jurors, among judges who will be taking these tasks, because I think that's really a fundamental and foundational problem. The second thing I would want to do is loosen the uh, chokehold that the adversarial system seems to have on our legal system. Uh, there is very little opportunity uh, if you, for, uh, to depart from the traditional means of adversarial uh, presentations and party control of the evidence. And if you look at the other countries, the other common law countries that have faced the same kinds of problems, with increasingly complex evidence. What you see is they've been able to make choices that I don't think are available in the United States. In England, basically, they pushed the respondents to, to have one expert that the parties could work together to choose, but basically it avoids a lot of the conflicts and a lot of the built-in bias that some experts might bring to the table. That's my pitch. Yeah, well, I actually agree with what both of my esteemed colleagues said, and I, and I uh, worry all the time about the anti-science bent of uh, our society um, and you know the various conflicts that that is um, causing. Um, the other thing I think that I would like, if I could wave a magic wand, is to see more scientific societies engaging with the appellate courts um, in submitting amicus briefs. Um, you know, as, as I think you can see, we have a pretty rigorous um, way in which we go about it to make sure where there's really clear science that supports a brief that we are submitting. I mean, I think other organizations could do that in other arenas. Obviously, we're focused on psychological science, but there's a lot of other science that's relevant in the courts. And so it might be helpful if more professional uh, societies uh, also consider doing that. Uh, on that point, if I may, and also in the interest of full disclosure, we have signed on to a couple of briefs that you all have, have, have prepared, uh, and we are, uh, at, at AAAS are actually working on trying to enhance our capacity to do that kind of scanning and so forth, but we're, we're taking baby steps. We, we have been involved before, including, as was mentioned very early on in, in, the, in, the, in the Daubert case. Question from the audience, please. Uh, yeah, um, this is for Joe Cecil. I wonder if you could talk about tutorials as a mechanism for scientific education of judges in a way. It is part of your you know, magic wand of making a kind of non-adversarial product um, for judges or jurors perhaps uh, to be educated about a scientific phenomenon before they start hearing the expert testimony presented by each side. Right. Well, in fact, there are tutorials that have become more common in federal courts. Typically, these are in cases like uh, patent cases, just the heavy technology cases. And the role of the tutorial is basically to make sure that the judge gets up to speed. Often these tutorials are prepared by both parties. Often they choose a separate expert who will serve the role of uh, providing an instructor. They're typically done in the presence of the party, so everything's on the record. Uh, and a number of people have found this, a uh, number of individuals in patent cases have found this to be, to be very effective. So yeah, that, I think that's a great idea. Should have put it on my list. <laughs> Th thank you. Judge, please. Well, I'm not a judge, but um, I think you're looking at me. <laughs> yes, right. um, but definitely not a judge. Um, but I guess my, uh, my, my, my question is primarily for Sherry, but it's uh, born of something that 
Joe has said as well, which is the um, resistance in the adversarial system to permit forms of experimentation or to try uh, new things. I was struck by your data that the lawyers mostly didn't want anything, except maybe to let the juries ask questions, mm -hmm. but probably that's partly so that the juries would s keep paying attention and like them a little bit better, right? Like it's still sort of within adversarialism. Mm -hmm. And so it's great to have that data, but shouldn't we also wildly discount it? I mean, that is to say, I don't think that lawyers or judges in this system are very good at assessing the value or potential benefit of trying new experiments. And I mean, we saw we see this a little bit in Australia with concurrent evidence because lots of folks expected to hate it. And then it turned out when they started experimenting with hot tubbing, so it's called, many more people found it valuable both among the judges and among the witnesses. And so it's sort of a meta question of how could we begin to create a culture or spaces where there was a gameness to try some pilots, to experiment a little, to see what happens when we look at something. And some of them probably wouldn't work, but the wild resistance to making use of the tools that we do have or to try new things um, seems like one of the only features that all the participants agree on. Uh, yes, uh, that's that's a very good description of um, of. of resistance. There are some exceptions, and I think that they have occurred where there has been enormously strong leadership um, from a collaboration between judges and attorneys. So in the Seventh Circuit, we had a, a jury project that included um, some, uh, it, 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 we couldn't get experimentation, but judges did different versions of some of these reforms and we did, and we did study them. Um, and uh, it, the result of that was that there were some changes that, that, were, that were made um, uh, by some judges. But not, you know, judges ha have their own fiefdoms, federal judges in particular, and getting system change is really, really hard. Um, Arizona is another example where there was a, 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 a committee of judges and an innovative judge, um, Mike Dan, who had done a master's um, at Virginia uh, and wrote a paper on using an educational model um, uh, for for trials for jurors, um, and and they passed a, they got a bunch of changes um, uh, passed, and oh by the way, they also got permission to do the study that I I described at the beginning of my talk, which was an experiment where jur some jury trials permitted the jurors to discuss the case amongst themselves during the trial and uh, the control uh, did the traditional one of uh, telling them they couldn't uh, talk. So there are little right. pieces, but they are minuscule, and, and I, can't, I don't know of a system version, which is what I think you're looking for. Thanks. Joel, did, oh, okay, please. Uh, I have a quick question for Dr. Diamond. Your data was really interesting to see. Um, I think I've been operating under a false pretense that most scientists are fearful to engage in the, the legal world. Um, I'm curious if your data is broken down by discipline at all or by career level to, to better understand kind of across the, the different sectors what that looks like. Thank you. Yeah, um, uh, we haven't done that yet. We will do that. We do have background um, information. Um, on, on, the, uh, uh, on, the, on the participants. Um, the, uh, so I, I guess I wouldn't want to say what I think is going on there uh, until I'm really, really comfortable with, with the analysis on it. I suspect there's some, uh, there's some uh, variation in, in, their, in their comfort uh, uh, level. Um, uh, but on a gross level, I can say there were not huge differences. Um, I, I want to say one other thing because there's been some talk about the fact 
that um, it's a, there's a negative uh, attitude uh, towards science. But what our data showed um, when we asked, uh, we asked the question, um, how do you think, uh, how would you rate the legal system's uh, ability to handle um, uh, science and law? Um, and um, uh, a, a majority of the respondents um, thought that it did a good or very good job, okay? Uh, mostly somewhat good, not, you know, very good. Um, uh, but uh, the, the, and the interesting thing about that was that those who had in fact participated as experts in the system gave higher marks to the, um, to the legal system, its ability to handle science. They thought that the lawyers were more capable of understanding science than those who had never participated. Um, so, you know, the, I, again, not the correlation, but there you have it. I, I know we were supposed to have a coffee break. Joel, was there one more question from the audience somewhere? Out There's there? one more question from online, and I'll, sure. I'll paraphrase it. Uh, how could scientists or those with science backgrounds, such as science communication or writing, uh, get more involved with amicus curiae briefs um, and if that's something that you would recommend individuals do, uh, are there processes through their professional associations that, that you would recommend? So I don't know how it works in too many other organizations, but I would think that if there's an amicus curiae program at, uh, you know, another pre professional association is also somehow related to their Office of General Counsel. So I think if you're you know, a member of a professional society, reach out to your Office of General Counsel. Say, do we participate in amicus briefs? If we do, how do we do it? Is there, and, you know, in my case, I have an expert panel. You know, vacancies become available on the expert panel, so we could look for adding somebody uh, you know, who has particular skills that would be useful. But that, I would think that would be the best way to go. Thank you all very, very much. Uh, round of applause, please. Our excellent panel.